Welcome to the Guiding Principles Part 2 module. By the end of this module, you'll be able to describe the nature, use and interaction of the Guiding Principles and explain the use of the last four Guiding Principles. Now let's look at the remaining Guiding Principles. The next principle is Collaborate and Promote Visibility. When initiatives involve the right people in the correct roles, efforts benefit from better buy-in, more relevance and increased likelihood of long-term success. All service management approaches such as ITIL, DevOps, Agile and Lean depend on effective collaboration. The concept of the ITIL service value system is based on a system of components working together in an integrated and harmonious fashion to produce value in the form of products and services. Silo activity, where there is a reluctance or inability among the various functions or business units to share information and work together, is likely to be to the detriment of the effective functioning and continual improvement of the SVS. A spirit of collaboration and openness should therefore be characteristic of the operation of the organisation. This would be reflected in higher levels of cooperation and trust between the organisation and its customers and suppliers, as well as between internal teams and functions, such as development and operations. Tangible barriers to collaboration may exist, including, for example, a lack of process or technology integration between stakeholders, and the organisation should seek to identify and break down these barriers. The next principle to be discussed, think and work holistically, will help in this respect. In any change, there is always an impact on people. The impact could be small or it could be significant. The number of individuals and groups affected, directly or indirectly, could be few or many. For any initiative, an appropriate amount of attention should be given to identifying and engaging the affected stakeholder groups. The work being done, its importance and the results being achieved should be effectively communicated so that they are visible to all stakeholders. This helps reduce the likelihood of hidden agendas becoming a factor and increases awareness, enthusiasm and buy-in. A lack of visibility, on the other hand, increases speculation, uncertainty and resistance to change. When stakeholders have poor visibility of an initiative, there is also a risk that they will come to regard it as low priority or even stalled when prioritising their own work. Visibility helps the organisation understand the amount of work in progress, enabling it to identify potential bottlenecks and waste, as well as any excess capacity. This in turn helps the organisation prioritise and drive through improvements. To apply the principle of collaborate and promote visibility, organisations should consider the following. Collaboration does not mean consensus. While all contributions should be acknowledged, it is not always possible or even desirable to get consensus on all points. Communicate in a way the audience can hear. Communication with stakeholders should be targeted and tailored to the needs of the different groups. Selecting the right message and method of communication for each audience is essential. Decisions can only be made on visible data, so the need for data should drive decisions over what work needs to be made visible and how. The next principle is think and work holistically. No service, practice, process, team or supplier stands alone and organisations must think holistically in their approach to service management. Organisations create their service value system from all of the resources and capabilities available to them. The SVS functions optimally when all of these components work together in an integrated and harmonious way. Organisations therefore need to understand the complex interactions and dependencies that occur end-to-end -end throughout the SVS from the capture of demand to the output of product and services. In a complex system of connected parts, the alteration of any one element can have a significant impact on others and therefore has to be done carefully and thoughtfully. The four dimensions are key to holistic thinking.
Imagine, for example, that the language application service provider we discussed earlier in the course decides to invest in a new call management system through which all service user requests for support and information will, in future, be logged and managed. This is a component that sits in the information and technology domain and a lot of thought will have to be given to the impact this will have on other components within that domain. For example, the current operating environment may need to be upgraded in order to host this new system. Internal tools with which the current call management system interfaces, such as configuration management systems, may need to be modified or updated to work with the new system. In addition, it may be necessary to consider potential impact on service user technology interfaces. Will the devices that the service users use to access support currently work as well with the new system? Will users need information about how to reconfigure their connections, for example? Equal consideration will need to be given to the other domains. The new tool will probably include a range of additional functionality and automation capabilities, which can be used to support different activities across value streams and processes. In addition to providing an opportunity to streamline and improve certain activities, other process changes may be necessary before the tool can even be deployed. Consideration will also need to be given to the impact on the organization and people. What stakeholders, internal and external, will need to be kept informed about this change and what do they need to know? Who will need training in order to use the new tool? Is there a need to update user support guides? In order to exploit the full functionality of the new tool, changes to roles and responsibilities may be required. Finally, the potential impact on supplier interfaces will need to be considered. Imagine if, after months of planning and preparation, the tool was deployed only for the organization to find that key suppliers were unable to interface with the new system, so could not receive and respond to calls. To apply the principle of think and work holistically, organizations should consider the following. Recognize the complexity and adaptive nature of the systems and apply appropriate methods and rules for managing them. Look for patterns in the needs and interactions of system elements to identify what is essential for success. Automation can facilitate working holistically. Collaboration is key to thinking and working holistically. The next principle is keep it simple and practical. The key message of this principle is always use the minimum number of steps needed to accomplish an objective. An outcome-based way of thinking is the surest way of achieving this. Whether designing a new practice, process, service or metric, or analysing existing ones, always ask how it contributes to the desired outcomes and to the creation of value. When asking the question, be careful to consider all perspectives and look out for conflicting objectives. For example, the people involved in a process may feel that the data they are expected to record is excessive and actually constrains process performance, whereas the senior managers may value this information. In these situations, a balance should be sought between the competing objectives. When designing or improving service management, it is usually better to start with an uncomplicated approach. Additional controls, activities or metrics can always be added later if needed. When creating a process, for example, trying to provide a solution for every exception will often lead to over-engineering, resulting in process models which are overly complex. You can usually spot these by the amount of nested decision boxes. Designers need to think about exceptions, but they cannot cover them all and, in most cases, shouldn't try. Instead, Rules should be designed that can be used to handle exceptions generally, enabling individuals to use their own skills, experience and judgment in a guided way. To apply the principle of keep it simple and practical, organisations should consider the following. Ensure that every activity contributes to the creation of value. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It may seem harder to simplify, but it is often more effective. Do fewer things, but do them better. 
Eliminating activities which have no value enables more focus on the quality of those that do. Respect the time of the people involved. A process that is too complicated and bureaucratic is a poor use of the time of the people involved. It is also one of the main reasons people give for not following process. The easier a process is to understand and follow, the more likely people are to adopt it. Simplicity is the best route to achieving quick wins. Combined with the principle of progress iteratively with feedback, this approach can quickly deliver incremental value at regular intervals. The final principle is optimize and automate. As we mentioned earlier in the course, service providers do not have an infinite amount of resources and capabilities, and so they must maximize the value of the work carried out by their human and technical resources. Optimization means to make something as effective and useful as it needs to be. Optimization is different to simplification, the focus of the previous principle. A process could be simple, but the way it is currently executed may be less than optimal. Automation typically refers to the use of technology to perform a step or series of steps correctly and consistently with limited or no human intervention. However, it could also mean the standardization and streamlining of manual tasks. Let's walk through an example. An organization has a large service desk dealing with a high volume of calls. Amongst the many types of call they receive are users who have forgotten their password and need it to be reset. The process is very simple. The user is asked to provide a number of verifiable identification details and answer a predefined personal security question, after which the desk analyst resets the password while the user is still on the phone. To verify the user details, however, the desk analyst must log on to an HR application. Because of internal policy, they are not allowed to leave this application open while they're not using it. So they must do this every time, which is time consuming. The service desk manager decides to optimize this activity by separating it from the rest of the incoming calls. She chooses analysts who will each spend one day per week doing only password resets. The telephone system is updated so users can select password reset from a list of options while they are in the call queue. They are then automatically routed through to a dedicated line. Call time for password reset is significantly reduced, partly because the analyst does not need to continually keep logging on and off the HR system, but also because the analysts become more practiced in the routine of resetting passwords. As an additional bonus, there is a slight increase in productivity among the other analysts who are no longer having to do password resets. After a few weeks, however, the analysts involved in staffing the password reset line begin to grumble. They do not look forward to their password days. They feel it is not a good use of their skills. Fortunately, the desk manager had foreseen this and already had a technician working on providing a technical solution. The next stage of optimization for this process is the introduction of an entirely automated password reset process. Via the corporate intranet, users can enter their details electronically along with the answer to their security system, and they are automatically sent a link to reset their password. The process is essentially the same, but it has been optimized and automated. Automation for automation's sake is rarely a good idea, but used well, automation can manage frequent and repetitive tasks, saving the organization costs, reducing human error, and allowing human resources to be used to better effect for complex decision making. ITIL defines the path to optimization in a series of high level steps. Understand and agree the optimization context, making sure that the vision and objectives are clear. Assess the current state to understand where the biggest opportunities for improvement lie. Agree the objectives and priorities, focusing on simplification and value. Ensure stakeholder engagement and commitment. Execute the improvements in an iterative way. Continually monitor the impact of optimization.
To apply the principle of optimize and automate, organizations should consider the following. Simplify and or optimize before automating. Define outcome-based metrics and measure the before and after states to measure the achievements. Use all of the other guiding principles when applying this one.